Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Dr. Gabriel Herskew. Dr. Gabriel Herskew is a vascular and endovascular surgeon specializing in minimally invasive treatment of arterial and venous disease. He specializes in office-based treatments for varicose veins and other chronic vein disease. Dr. Herskew attended medical school at the University of California, Irvine School of Medicine. He obtained his general surgery training at the UC Irvine Medical Center and then a two-year vascular and endovascular surgery fellowship at the University of Southern California Medical Center in Los Angeles. He has dedicated training in vascular ultrasound and is the medical director of the vascular laboratory. So today we'll be talking about varicose veins and chronic venous disease. And my goal of this talk is to give you some basic understanding of uh, anatomy and physiology and venous disease. And when you go and see a vascular surgeon for treatment of your veins, there's often not enough time to really delve into the basic concepts and the science behind what's happening. So you'll get a background that most people don't have even before undergoing treatment. You'll understand anatomy and physiology of the venous system, some of the diseases affecting the venous system, and then some of the treatments available for varicose veins and chronic venous disease, as well as some of the vascular emergencies related to veins. This is one part of what vascular surgeons do. We concentrate quite a bit on arteries in practice. Most of the vascular emergencies have to do with arterial problems rather than veins, but there are some that are related to venous disease, and we'll cover some of those today. So, the first question is, what are veins? Veins are very different from arteries. The arteries transport the blood away from the heart to the tissues, and then the veins bring the blood back. Veins are different in the capacitance. They hold more of your blood than the arteries do. They're a larger volume. 60 to 80 percent of your total blood volume is in your veins, and they're much lower pressure than the arteries. So when we think of blood pressure, the 120 milli millimeters mercury systolic blood pressure that you may have measured has to do with your arteries and not your veins. The veins have a much lower pressure most of the time. The anatomy of the vein is, is similar but has some differences. The artery has a much thicker muscular wall. The lumen is smaller in the artery than the vein and the arteries have the ability to contract and tighten up to raise the blood pressure. The veins are not able to do that quite as well. They do contract to some degree but it's a much weaker contraction. The veins are able to distend tremendously if you pressurize them so they can distend way out. And the function of veins, as I said, is to return the blood to your heart. And the way that your body does this is through a series of valves. The hemodynamic system that returns the blood is actually very advanced. Basically, you're transporting the blood from down here up, back up to the heart against gravity. And so how does the body do that is what we're, we'll discuss. These are the deep veins uh, going back to the heart. And much of the disease that we'll talk about in relation to varicose veins has to do with the superficial veins. So we'll talk about the distinction between those also. So this is a basic diagram of the veins in, in the lower extremity. The deep veins are here in the center, the femoral vein, the popliteal vein is here, and then the tibial veins. And there are superficial veins, and the most important one for me to tell you about is the great saphenous vein. There's also a small saphenous vein that goes down the back of the calf, but those are two that we'll be talking about to some degree today in discussing varicose veins. The arteries somewhat parallel the veins. They bring the blood down. They run side by side, but with the flow going different directions, like, like cars on a freeway going two different directions. 
So the venous pressure in the lower extremities has to do with gravity. And the actual equation is the density of blood times the gravitational pull times the height of the column of fluid. And so the height of the column of fluid, if you measure it all the way up, would be quite a bit of pressure down the legs. And so if we look at the patient standing, and if they have 150 centimeters of height for this column, your blood pressure would be 117 millimeters of mercury approximately, which is not a very good venous blood pressure. It would be fine for the arterial pressure, but not for the venous. So what we see is that this pressure can actually, if you go all the way from the top to bottom, can be very high in the veins at the level of the feet. So the body overcomes this by breaking it into segments, so that instead of a height all the way up to your heart and down to your feet, it's broken into segments so that the actual height of the column of fluid is shorter. And this is accomplished using valves. These are one-way valves inside the veins so that when the blood moves up, the valve opens, and when the blood moves back down or when gravity pulls the blood back down, it closes. And so the placement of these valves means that the pressure is limited by them and, and it, the maximum pressure would be at the bottom of the, each segment where the valve is, but it's never transmitted down any further. And then every beat of your heart that causes the pumping of blood through your tissues and through the capillaries and back to the venous system, and every movement of your muscles causes that blood to move up. And your body doesn't let it lose that that gain. It, it, it blood stays up because the valves are functioning and holding, holding the, the column of blood up. And these valves were described a long time ago. In the 1500s, there were drawings of these valves in human anatomy. I don't know that they completely understood what they were for, but you could see they, they knew exactly where they were, and this is just how they would be if you opened them up the long way along the veins and, and exposed them. They look just like that. So this is from their anatomic dissections many years ago. So the deep venous system and the superficial venous system are treated a little bit different in vascular surgery. The deep venous system is the one that communicates directly with the vena cava and the heart. It is surrounded by muscle. That's what differentiates it, is that it's surrounded by muscle, and the muscle contractions are able to push the blood through the deep venous system up. And it does contain valves, and this is where, the deep system is where you get the dangerous blood clots. When you hear of someone dying from a blood clot, a pulmonary embolus, this is where it's coming from, is the deep venous system, not the superficial system in general. Then the superficial venous system is the saphenous veins. This is a small saphenous and the great saphenous vein. These run in the fatty tissues of your legs, and there are communications between these that are called perforator veins. They communicate between the deep and the superficial. They also have uh, their own sort of valves so that the blood can't move back out to the superficial system. But you can see the blood goes up through these veins by any path and is limited by valves from going back down. And that's the basic concept that I want you to understand. Your calf muscle has a musculovenous pump that pumps the blood up every time you take a step. And walking is very important in venous disease, but even this, this, the smallest movements of your calf muscle, like pressing on the gas pedal in your car, that type of uh, heel raise calf movement, even that pumps a large amount of blood up each time you, you do that. So it's a very effective pump to bring the blood back to your heart. And it's located in the calf muscle in relation to the soleus muscle and the gastrocnemius muscles, which have these large areas of uh, reservoirs of blood that fill. Uh, and then each time you step, you pump this big uh, volume of blood back up to your heart. So here's a, a cartoon showing the basic function of this calf muscle pump. At rest, the veins dilate with contraction, you're squeezing this out against closed valves below, and the blood moves up. And then with relaxation, the valves below open and more blood comes in to fill the, the calf muscle reservoir. This is a very nice system. It works well as long as those valves are functioning. And what happens if we look at the venous pressure, if measured directly in the veins, you'll find that the venous pressure as you do calf raises and that movement of the calf muscle pump the venous pressure will go down and down and down. That's because you're pumping all that venous blood out, and so the pressure in the veins doesn't distend the veins anymore. You get a low-pressure system. 
And then as you relax, the pressure will little by little raise up. And this is the, the arterial flow going down into the calf, the foot, returning from the foot, begins to fill those veins. And as they become more distended, the pressure goes up until it reaches a maximum pressure again. And so this is a normal function of a calf muscle pump. So every time you're moving the calf muscle pump, uh, it lowers the pressure. And so when, when patients ask me what to do on plane rides, that's what I tell them. I say, just pump your foot back and forth every 30 minutes or every hour. That's all you have to do to clear out the whole system and get the blood moving again. It decreases the edema, keeps your legs feeling a little better, and decreases the risk of a blood clot during plane rides. So what happens when there's disease? Well, a, a large part of venous disease has to do with broken valves, what we call venous insufficiency, where the valves are not functioning the way that they're supposed to. And this can happen for many reasons. Uh, typically, the deep veins are more robust and the valves don't break very easily. So the things that break the deep valves are things like blood clots. If there's a big blood clot there and an inflammatory problem, that can break the valves. The other things are things like major trauma, which often causes blood clots on its own, or surgery, things like that. So the superficial veins, however, become broken quite easily, and even normal aging can lead to some broken valves. So this is just a demonstration showing what a dilated, broken vein would look like. This is what it should look like with the valve open and closed. And then as it becomes, the pressure is raised and the valve is broken, you get a, a tortuous vein that has an insufficiency and the valve can't close all the way. So when we measure the venous pressure in someone with broken valves, it's a different picture. So instead of this drop to a low pressure with a slow rise in pressure following, which takes about 30 seconds, you get a drop that doesn't go quite as low and it rises right back up. So the pressure is higher and you can't keep it low. This is, this is where your body wants to be, is that low venous pressure. The high venous pressure is uncomfortable and causes much of the, the symptoms of vein disease. So some of the changes that happen long term with vein disease are varicose veins. You can get swelling or edema of the lower extremities. The skin changes can happen in the, in the legs and you can also actually get ulceration. So why, does this, why is this happening? What, what's the reason for this? Well, the varicose veins kind of make sense. You're, you're taking away, you're, you're pressurizing them. So all the little branches of those veins become larger and larger and larger until you can see them on the skin. And so we're talking about mainly the superficial system in relation to varicose veins. But these veins, those are little branches that have just become very large and they keep, to grow, keep growing and growing. The swelling is from the blood pressure being high in the veins. So some of that fluid is transferred through the walls of the veins or through the capillary walls into the tissues and stays in the leg. And so you can get a chronic swelling of the leg. The skin changes are a little bit less clear, but this has to do with the hemoglobin staying in one place in your leg. So with the high pressure in the capillaries and the venous uh, congestion, the hemoglobin and the, specifically the iron associated with the hemoglobin is transferred to the skin. And so this is actually rust. It's oxidized iron. So this is the, the changes in color in the skin are happening in the, in the gator regions, we call this area. And they darken the skin long term. And so you'll see that very commonly, people walking around with that darkened area of their leg. And that can be a sign of venous insufficiency. The ulcerations happen when the venous pressure is so high that the arterial pressure is not enough to transfer the oxygen to the tissue. So they're, they're both too high, so the blood doesn't move. It stays put, and there's not enough oxygen to support the tissue, and, and nutrients are not delivered, and so the tissue dies and you end up with an ulcer. And these can be sometimes very challenging to heal. So there are two basic paths toward the venous damage or venous insufficiency and its related symptoms. The first is uh, obstruction. So if you do have a blockage somewhere, you can imagine the pressure will be very high in the veins. So it's the same problem, but a different uh, etiology or a different way of it occurring. And then insufficiency is the second one, which I described before. And this is usually related to valve damage. And then some patients will have both obstruction and reflux or obstruction and insufficiency. I use the term reflux and insufficiency interchangeably. They, they both mean the same thing. 
which is that the valves are broken or it's not supporting that column of blood the way it should. So let's talk a little bit about deep vein thromboses and pulmonary embolus. So this is what gets all the media attention because it accounts for a high mortality in the United States and there's a great deal of focus placed on this, on preventing these in hospital situations especially and post-surgically. So uh, there's approximately uh, 500,000 cases of deep vein thrombosis per year. The mortality estimates are 50 to 100,000 people per year are dying of something related to this. Pulmonary embolus means that the clot which formed somewhere has moved. So it's an embolus means that it's a, it's a moving object in the, in the bloodstream. And so typically a clot will form in the leg and then go downstream up to the heart and go into the heart circulation and block one of the vessels in the heart. And so we call that a pulmonary embolus and that can cause an immediate death if that happens. So that's a very serious problem when it happens. So if the clot stays in the leg, it, it can cause a very high venous pressure as we described, so blockage of the blood flow out of the leg which can be limb threatening. In other words, you can, you can have a risk of losing your leg from this problem. When it's a, a severe problem, we call it phlegmasia, which is a limb threatening ischemia or lack of blood flow in the leg. And then patients who have had a blood clot sometimes suffer from a problem with chronic swelling, changes in their leg and pain or other symptoms that we call a post-thrombotic syndrome. And this is often related to those valves in the deep system breaking from the blood clot being there. So it's similar to what I was describing earlier. Virchow's triad is a description of a blood clot or a, a stasis conditions. So this is how blood clots form. There's a combination of the blood not moving, hypercoagulability from one thing or another, and sometimes it can just be another illness. If you're sick with something else, it can cause a hypercoagulable state. Cancer, trauma cause you to form clots more easily. And then vein damage inside the veins, and that can be related to the insufficiency. Uh, it can be related to surgery. It can be related to trauma. There's a number of different things that can cause these. But when these are together, you're more likely to form a blood clot in your veins. Here's a picture of embolus and the a diagram of the heart with the blood flow coming up through the inferior vena cava and getting pumped into the cardiac circulation. And so that's, that's how a pulmonary embolus can cause problems. This is a picture of phlegmasia cerulea dolens, which means literally painful blue swelling, but this is basically a dying limb that may require amputation if we don't act immediately. So this is a surgical emergency when this happens. And this is related to a blood clot forming in the deep system and blocking all the blood from getting out of the leg. So you can see that it's, it's swollen uh, as compared to the other leg. It's, it's uh, what we call cyanotic, or that blue color. This requires an immediate intervention. And this picture shows the toes, which are actually already uh, at, these, these may not be salvageable toes. There's maybe a little bit of gangrene happening on the tips of the toes. As I said, this is from loss of adequate blood flow to the tissues. Now historically, these were, this was treated with thrombectomy, and so a, an incision would be made, the vein would be opened, and the clot would be removed using a balloon catheter or just surgical dissection and pressure. To prevent the blood clot from going up to the heart, people would try to put things to block it. This is a uh, clip that was put on the vena cava to try and block some of the, the clots from getting up to the heart to save the person's life. It's managed differently today. The clip accomplished the same thing, but you could ligate the, the vena cava here, causing significant swelling in the legs, but it would stop that clot from going up to the heart. So that was one way it was treated. So I want to come back to this venous hypertension problem. So if you have a blockage, it, it creates a little bit different picture than the insufficiency. So remember I said that the insufficiency, you're able to drop the pressure a little bit and bring it back up, but it never gets quite as low in the veins as you want it to be. So this is our normal calf raises, drop in pressure, and return to normal. And this is with insufficiency where you can drop it some, but when it's actually blocked, you can't drop that pressure. In fact, as you move the muscles, the pressure goes up because the blood has nowhere to go and you're pumping more arterial blood into that limb. 
So you actually get, get a stable pressure or a, a rise in pressure from obstruction. When we evaluate patients, we try to determine whether they have an insufficiency or an obstruction. And that's, a, that's an important distinction because many of the treatments that you hear about, like laser ablations and injections and that sort of thing, are specifically for insufficiency. But if you haven't evaluated the patient for obstruction, uh, you haven't finished the full evaluation. And if there's obstruction present, it's pretty dramatic, and all your other treatments will fail if you, if you don't address that. One of the ways we uh, treat these patients when we have a suspicion of obstruction is with venography. So we'll put a catheter into the vein in the lower extremity, into the deep system, uh, and through that catheter can inject contrast, which shows up under x-rays. And so that looks something like this. The blood is visible as a dark substance in the veins. And I don't know if you can see this well enough, but the femoral vein here is showing that there's, it's open. And then there's an occlusion here. So you, can't, you see a lot of extra veins going all different directions. But the main vessel, which goes, should go right across, is, is absent. So that's, this is evidence of an old DVT that has, or blood clot, that has healed and recanalized. And so that looks something like this. What would be a normal vein is filled with scar tissue. And there's a few little channels where the blood can still get through, but you get kind of a funny looking venogram. And oftentimes there'll be many collaterals. Those other blood vessels that were going around, those develop because of the high pressure to uh, empty the, the blood from the lower extremities. Now if you look at the vein itself, this is an actual post-thrombotic vein. So this is a scarred vein from blood clot. It develops this scar tissue, which used to be blood clot. It becomes fibrinous tissue. So the blood has to get through these little holes and get back up through the vein to get to the heart. So these can be quite challenging to treat sometimes. And I'll show you uh, pictures in a moment of, of one where we treated that. So the current management of deep vein thrombosis is to prevent that from happening. It's a big part of the management. So we're more aggressive now. We have different methods, but we go after these blood clots early to try to stop them from damaging the valves and stop them from blocking off the veins like that. Patients with a blood clot are immediately put on blood thinners, which are often Lovenox or heparin. They're anticoagulated, usually with Coumadin, or now there's some newer blood thinners for three to six months. And if they have significant blood clots in their legs, they undergo a procedure called thrombolysis. You may have heard of thrombolysis in relation to strokes. When someone has a, a stroke and they're rushed to the hospital, they'll get a big dose of TPA, which is tissue plasminogen activator, which is a substance that can break down the clot immediately. So if a blood clot went up to their brain and caused a stroke, you can sometimes dissolve that. It has to be done within a few hours. But this is a similar treatment, but we go right to the clot and we put this substance, the same substance, the TPA, into the clot and try to dissolve it before it can cause the long-term damage. We sometimes treat that with pharmacomechanical thrombectomy, which are devices that grind up the clot and dissolve it at the same time. Surgical thrombectomy is not often used. That's the procedure where we actually make an incision and take the, blood, the clot out of the blood vessel. That's not generally done anymore, except in extreme situations. Sometimes we'll put in a vena cava filter, which I'll show you in a minute, which is instead of ligating or tying off the vena cava to protect the heart from blood clots, we'll put a little umbrella-like structure, that's a metal wire structure that can catch the clot if there's a big clot that comes up there. So we use those to protect the heart from blood clots, or if there's a reason why the, the patient cannot have blood thinners, if they're bleeding, if they have a stomach bleed or a, another gastrointestinal bleed or a brain problem. Long term, we treat with compression therapy, which can reduce some of the effects of post-thrombotic syndrome or this, these long-term effects. So post-thrombotic syndrome itself is pain, edema, skin changes, and ulceration after and usually caused by uh, the blood clot in the legs. Although there are probably some hormonal reasons and your body's reaction to the initial blood clot, it really has more to do with residual obstruction and venous reflux. That causes the majority of this problem. Sometimes we can't identify exactly why the problem occurs, but it is often related to some kind of obstruction problem or reflux. So 
Early walking after blood clots and compression stockings appear to delay this and, and improve it for patients. This is a treatment that we do for the initial blood clot. You can see the, the clot sitting in the venous valve. So these, these are the valves inside the vein, and the clot is sitting in here. This is a catheter that we put in that does two things. One is it administers that blood thinner medication, that clot busting medication, TPA. The other is that it uses ultrasound to break up the clot. And so it's causing a destructive type interference with the ultrasound. It's, it's causing it to break up the clot little by little. So we'll often leave these catheters in. We'll leave it in overnight, right through the clotted area, and then bring the patient back to the interventional suite and see how much clot is left and try and get rid of the rest. This is a pharmacomechanical thrombectomy device called AngioJet. This is inserted over a wire into the clot in the veins, and then it has this jet of saline that breaks up the clot, so it creates this little cyclone effect within the clot to break it up. The idea behind this is this Venturi principle where if the flow is faster, it, it, that tends to be a lower pressure, and so they use this to create this Venturi effect, and it actually sucks the clot back out into the machine as well. Here's another system that's used. This is the trellis peripheral infusion system. This one forms a occlusion on either side of the blood clot, so it isolates your blood clot area. So this seals inside the vein on either side. And then this sinusoidal wire rotates very fast around and around and grinds up the clot. It's like a little blender for the clot. And then you're able to withdraw it using syringes from inside between those two so you can suck out the fragments of clot and you try and get it cleared out before releasing the balloons. This is an inferior vena cava filter. It looks like a little umbrella. It comes inside a tube and you push it out of the tube and it springs open. The legs of this device push against the vena cava below the level of the heart, right about here. So if a blood clot comes up through the veins to go, trying to go up to the heart, it can get caught in here and it doesn't make it up. Now it could, it could completely block with clot, but that won't be a fatality. That can cause leg swelling, can cause other problems, but at least you save the patient's life by putting this in. So we put these in commonly and they can be removed also. So we have a similar, this little hook on the end is used for removal and they come out quite easily. So here's a picture of one in use. And what you can see is that the, the vena cava filter is inside the vena cava. We're shooting contrast up. And this is a blood clot that has been caught by the vena cava filter and it's sitting in the center. So this, this vena cava filter probably saved this patient's life. We do other interventions for venous problems. Stents are used. This is a relatively new use of stents, but some of the larger stents are used in veins, and these are the self-expanding stents that are kind of springy. Angioplasty is a term used for any intervention on a blood vessel, but balloon angioplasty has to do with going in the arteries and opening up arteries. So a similar process is used to open those veins. Remember that picture of the, uh, of the old venous clot that had all those little holes, and we push a wire through there, and then we put a balloon in there and rip all those fibr fibrotic strands apart. And then a stent is put in to hold it in that shape so that the blood can easily go through and we've, we release the obstruction. So these procedures are done in an interventional suite like this one using x-ray and angiograms. So I'll show you a case of, of one 75-year-old female with a history of a, of a deep vein thrombosis 15 years prior in the left leg. It was treated with blood thinners only. Uh, no interventions were performed at that time. She had a left leg discomfort, particularly when walking, varicose veins, and the veins, interestingly, extended all the way up onto the abdominal wall. So she underwent a venogram, and I'll, I'll go through these one at a time, but you'll see the blood flow going up through the venogram, and there's a problem somewhere in the pelvis. So if you look here at this, uh, up here, there's, there's blood going through this vessel, but that's not the, the main vessel to the vena cava. The common iliac vein is somewhere over here. So this is, these are all branches off of this vessel that are collaterals around an occlusion. So as I go through the venogram, you see the blood flowing. And these are all collaterals. So the blood is actually going up, hitting an obstruction here, and going across to the other side where it, it 
funnels into the normal venous system. So this patient underwent balloon angioplasty, and here's a picture of a balloon through that area. We pushed a wire through the occluded segment into the vena cava, and then a balloon was used to dilate that area. And subsequently, stent was placed. So you can see the stent sitting in here, going from here all the way into the vena cava. This is the whole occluded segment and it goes all the way down to here. And so the, afterwards, the angiogram shows the blood flowing through the normal channel into the vena cava. So this is where the blood should go, and, and relieving that obstruction, treating this patient completely relieved her symptoms. She had some mild edema after that in the legs, mild swelling, but the pain when she walked was completely gone. And so she's very happy with the result, and now she's treated with compression stockings only and hasn't required any other interventions. So let's move on to varicose veins. It's estimated that 72% of women and 42% of men will experience varicose veins by the time they're in their 60s. So it's very prevalent. It's correlated to age and gender. Women are more likely to have varicose veins. And the risk factors include multiple pregnancies, a family history of varicose veins, obesity, a profession in which you do a lot of standing, and history of blood clots or obstruction. Venous damage happens through multiple channels. Uh, you can see thrombosis, which we've been talking about here, leading to other problems like pulmonary embolus. This is a blood clot in the superficial veins. It can lead over here to varicose veins, chronic venous insufficiency. And then there are some other factors that can play into creating this vein injury that causes all these other things. And so the, the main thing to get out of this is that the Venous hypertension leads to varicose veins, whether it's through this hereditary problem and, and standing profession, multiple pregnancies, etc., or through a blood clot. Either way, you have the same problem, which is the, the pressure in the veins gets too high, and that, cause, that leads to this problem. So historically, varicose veins were mentioned as early as 1559 B.C. Surgery was not, a, not an option at that time, but there are some descriptions. Hippocrates in 460 to 377 BC stated, in the case of an ulcer, it's not ex expedient to stand, more especially if the ulcer is situated in the leg. The sore is frequently wiped with a sponge and dry piece of clean cloth applied. Ulcers which are foul will not heal. Well, he was on the right track. That's a lot of what we do now for these venous ulcers, especially if there's not something that we can fix. Try to keep them clean, uh, but we do use compression also. In the, the Dark Ages, the evil humor was the cause of these problems. Varices were thought to originate by the weight of stagnant blood on the veins. It was thought dangerous to heal the leg ulcers because the skin covering over them would trap it inside, the evil humors. Another quotation from that era, a leg ulcer in old people should be left alone and if healed should be opened to drain for humors that if not drained may produce serious illness. So there is some, some surgical prowess to that in that you don't want to trap infection inside, but they, they didn't understand the, the overall concept. And then Thomas v Vickery, 1536, the legs when wounded are very perilous because unto them runneth a great quantity of humors. Venous physiology was revealed later. The French anatomist, as we showed before, described the veins in valves. In 1544 was the first description of the function of valves. And William Harvey in 1628 had the first description of the true anatomy and function of the circulation. So that's when they started understanding the uh, arterial and venous circulation. And this is a picture from that manuscript, the tourniquet on the arm showing distension of the valves. And then this, this picture showing that, which you may be familiar with if you occlude one side, the one directional nature of the venous valves. So he's occluding one and releasing and showing that it doesn't backflow to his other. That was showing that the valves are unidirectional. This is a picture of a votive offering from a grateful Greek patient to his doctor, commemorating successful treatment of a varicose vein. So how do we find venous disease? So there are several levels. Of course, the history and physical is the most important. Try to relate the patient's symptoms and physical examination to what's going on. We, I often have a good idea of what the treatment will be even before we order any tests. So that's the considered level one examination. The level two examination is the non-invasive studies. 
Primarily, we use ultrasound and pressure studies to figure out whether or not there's broken valves in the legs or obstruction. CT scan and MRI are useful to some degree. They can show the larger veins and whether or not there's a compressive element, something pushing on them, or an occlusion. But if they do show a problem, often we have to go to level three, which is the venogram, like I showed you before, where it's an actually invasive procedure performed in an angiography suite where a tube is inserted in the vein and x-rays and contrast used to see where, where the blood flow is going. So the symptoms of venous insufficiency include aching, a heaviness and tension in the legs, a feeling of swelling, tiredness, restless legs, cramps at night, and itching and dryness of the skin. Patients will often have had previous surgeries for veins. There's often a, a history of trauma or car accidents affecting the lower extremities. Central lines can cause damage to the veins if they're placed during hospital admissions. They often have multiple visits to the emergency room. Some people get recurrent cellulitis or skin infections because of the swelling and the dry skin. Uh, some patients have an actual history of deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolus. Some people have a family history of those. And I always try to figure out their functional status. You know, that often people will complain of this sort of thing and they, I find out that they are not somebody who walks or they require help with every bit of care during the day. There's different elements that really do play into our choice of whether or not to do anything about the problem or to do a procedure. We then move on to physical examination. And so the signs of chronic venous disease may be as small as spider veins, which are shown here. And maybe these, these are called reticular veins. Uh, we, the distinction is rather minor. They're a little bit deeper veins, so you can kind of see the reticular veins through the skin. They make sort of a lattice pattern underneath the skin. The spider veins are actually in the skin and very pronounced, dark, almost like you drew them with a pen. Varicose veins are the next level deeper and are larger. They're typically considered three millimeters or larger to be a varicose vein rather than the others. And these will often tent up the skin so you can see them as an actual change in the contour of the skin. Edema and darkening of the skin can happen. There's also a condition called lipodermatosclerosis, which is an inflammatory condition of the skin in response to the venous high blood pressure, where the skin becomes sort of this gray color I'm not sure you can see it that well, but it becomes a sort of the gray, hardened skin in reaction to the chronic venous insufficiency. And finally, you can have ulceration. This one's a pretty bad ulceration. These are typically not terribly painful lesions. They can be painful, but they're, they're, they look a little worse than they feel. However, they can be quite disabling. Uh, they can drain huge amounts of fluid and really cause a lot of problems in daily life. We evaluate most of these patients using Doppler ultrasound. It is basically sending sound waves into the tissue and bouncing it off of the blood flow to see the, the movement of the blood. Doppler is, is bouncing the sound waves off of the blood flow and gives a sound back. So you're basically getting that and it transmitted through computer components into a sound. Duplex has to do with actually putting it onto a graph on a computer screen and showing you where it's coming from based upon the depth of, in the tissue. So I have a quick demonstration that I'd like to do. If we can have somebody volunteer. This is just a Doppler, this little unit. And I'm going to put this on her vein and show that I, when I squeeze the blood flow in her hand, even gently, the venous blood will move up into her arm and you'll hear the blood flow uh, in the vein. You'll hear it as a whoosh inside with, with this device. So if I put it on the artery, so that's the artery, and that's the blood moving with the with the with the heart heartbeat. Now if I hold it just nearby and I squeeze the arm, you'll hear the the venous blood move. So the, I'm moving the venous blood. Let's see if I can. Other side. You hear the venous blood, so I'm squeezing it and it's a whole bunch of venous blood. So that's what happens each time you contract your muscle. It's squeezing the venous blood up uh, in the calf. Do we have any paper towel or something? Um, but we're able to tell when the blood's moving in a certain direction. And so if I squeeze from the other side and, and listen, 
I can see if the blood's moving the opposite direction across valves. And so that's a large part of what we yeah. do. Yeah, here it is. Thank you. Thank you. So if we, if we detect that the blood is moving the wrong direction across a valve, that tells us that that may be the source of the insufficiency and the source of the high blood pressure and can direct treatment from there. This picture on the left upper screen is, this is our duplex ultrasound. They've become quite advanced. They're still making improvements on this technology. But this is a demonstration of the blood moving in the wrong direction. And so the squeezing of the limb causes the sudden movement across, and you should see it stop because we're pushing it back across a valve. But in this patient, it keeps going across the valve. And so this is what we look for to see if the valve is broken. And that's, that, that's a broken valve. This is a MRI showing a blood clot in the vena cava. So this is the vena cava. This is a sectional slice through the body. And then this is a picture of a blood clot sitting up in the heart that has come from the leg and gone up to the heart. So that's in the pulmonary artery. And then venography is the invasive procedure that I described. And this is the gold standard to evaluate the veins. It doesn't tell you really how the valves are functioning, though. It just tells you whether they're open or not and where the blood's going. Intravascular ultrasound is another modality that we use. This is used during the invasive procedure or venography. It's placed inside the vein and slid along a wire up and down the vein, and it gives a 360 degree view with ultrasound. And so it, then it's put onto a screen and we can see the vein. So we get quite a bit of information. This is a renal artery next to the vein, so we're actually able to see structures outside of the vein itself as well. So the old treatment in the 7th century, the vein hook technique was described for treatment of varicose veins with ligatures above and below and then disruption of the vein in between. That is similar to current phlebectomy techniques. Then in the Middle Ages, stockings or these uh, laced compression stockings were first described. These were felt to trap the humors and to be palliative, but we still use this today. This stockings and compression therapy is one of the main tenets of vein treatment still. Here's another quotation. When we consider how filthy the habits of many persons are who often leave their feet unwashed for weeks and months together, it cannot be wondered that skin so neglected should in the decline of life possess a very imperfect vitality. Daily washing of the lower limbs with a piece of flannel and yellow soap and water is one of the best means of reviving their delayed powers. This is from 1797. And finally, the limb should be well and evenly bandaged from the toes to the knee, observing that the bandage is to be applied most tightly below and more loosely by degrees as it ascends. So this is still the main treatment for leg ulcers, exactly as described. You clean them up and you bandage it from the, from the foot all the way up to the, just below the knee, more tightly at the bottom and looser on, as you go up. So we haven't really made a whole lot of progress since then in terms of the leg ulcers. However, the, the other treatment modalities do give us an advantage and we have a much higher success of, treat, of treating now. So the treatment options include compression, which I just described. There are some pharmacologic or medicine therapies for venous disease, wound and skin care, if there are wounds, and interventional management. So Paul Gerson Una in the 1800s and early 20th century described an Una boot, which is a compression wrap, and then because there's an inflammatory process in the skin in reaction to venous high blood pressure, zinc was used and it, would, it, it tends to be anti-inflammatory and calm the skin down while providing moisturization as well. So these are wrapped. We often apply these on a weekly basis. You leave it on for a week. It's called an Una boot. It gives 20 to 30 millimeters mercury compression. The idea behind the compression and why we use that is that that muscular pump that I told you about, where your muscles are squeezing the veins each time you contract them, it benefits from compression on the outside. So if you think about it, the muscle's going to contract and it kind of balls up. If you put something that's not, that's that restricts it, it's going to squeeze all that venous blood out because it's going, to, it's going to have to go in and squeeze the vein even more. So you eject more of the blood out of the calf than you would otherwise. And so that's the idea behind these compression wraps. And they're meant to be non elastic they're not supposed to be elastic and stretchy. They're supposed to be uh, more rigid and that the ones that we apply weekly accomplish that and that's the fastest way to heal the wounds in the lower extremities. 
We do use compression therapy, like compression stockings, and some of them are quite tight. They can be very difficult to put on. If we can use a 30 to 40 millimeter compression stocking, which is a graded compression stocking, tighter at the bottom and looser as you go up, you'll get significant improvement for venous disease, including decreased swelling, decreased skin pigmentation, and increased uh, mobility and well-being. The compression is effective in healing ulcers and preventing recurrence. 93% of patients with ulcers can achieve complete healing at a mean of about five months. So drugs for venous disease are not very widely used. They're not that effective. People use them more in Europe than they do here. There's four basic classes. I won't go into much detail on these. There's a drug called horse chestnut seed extract, which is a naturopathic type therapy. It's not a controlled substance. You can buy it at a Whole Foods and places like that. But it does seem to decrease edema related to venous disease, and it does seem to help ulcers heal to some degree. The mechanisms are largely unknown. The blood thinners and, and anti-inflammatory things like aspirin and this other one called pentoxyphylline really don't offer much benefit, and I don't prescribe that for patients with vein problems. Wound care has made some progress in, in treating venous ulcers. We do use antibacterial agents. We use absorbent dressings that help to get all that fluid out of the wound and decrease the maceration of tissue, decrease the risk of infection. There's a product called Aplograph, which is a engineered material that is like skin. It's a two-layer matrix of cow collagen, human fibroblasts, and keratinocyte stem cells that is approved for use in venous stasis ulcers. It does offer some benefit for healing ulcers, but really compression has to be used still. Here's a picture of, of that in use with wound healing at, at 10 months. They used compression therapy, the wound care, and the Aplograph, so uh, this ulcer was able to heal. So varicose vein treatments are a little different than the ulcer treatments. We do sometimes do the varicose vein treatments for healing ulcers because the goal is to decrease the venous pressure. So we relieve any obstructive component first. So if there's a blockage up in the pelvis like the one I showed you on the venogram, that has to be treated first if you want any success at treating varicose veins in the legs. And then the goal after that is to decrease the venous blood pressure by having the blood go through the veins that have good valves. That's basically the short answer to that. So what we do is we end up closing off the veins that have bad valves or removing them. So the problem veins that are transmitting the pressure down into the leg are either ligated and stripped or closed off through uh, other techniques. So ligation and stripping is the surgical treatment for varicose veins. This has been done for many years. It's a real surgery. You have to go under anesthesia and a, an incision is made at the top of the leg and then another one lower down the leg and a stripping device, which is a long wire type device, is passed through that into the vein and down through the vein and then out of the vein at the lower incision. And then a head is put on there, the, a larger head is placed on the end of this wire and it's forcefully withdrawn and it rips the whole vein out of the leg. It's typically done in the saphenous vein, but if that saphenous vein is causing the varicose veins and bringing all this high blood pressure down into the lower leg, removing it takes away the problem and, and you actually can get rid of that swelling and pain and edema and all those symptoms, but you have to get through the surgery first. And this typically takes one to two weeks to recover from before you're walking normally again, and it's, it's, a, it's a tough process to go through. Here's the actual devices used. And I still do this sometimes for people who are not candidates for the other procedures. But this is the wire that's passed through the vein. This is a handle for pulling on the wire. And then different size stripping heads can be placed. So you pass it through, and then you apply the stripper head, and then you yank it back out, and the, and the vein is removed. So for spider varicosities, injections can be done. This is a very small needle. It's almost like an acupuncture needle. It's so small. It's inserted into the spider varicosities, and then the sclerosant material, which is typically a detergent type of material, is injected. And you can see, visually, you, you can see it blanch as the fluid goes through the veins. And then that causes damage to the inside of those tiny vessels and they just scar down. And when they scar, they're not dark anymore. They scar more like scar tissue, a lighter color. So they tend to disappear. 
And the sclerosin can be used like this as a liquid in the smaller veins. And as you get into the larger veins, sometimes you need to use an ultrasound to find where you're going. And it can be injected directly into the larger veins. And sometimes we make it into a foam so it fills the vein completely. And you can follow it under ultrasound to see where that foam is going. And so the treatment of spider veins can look like this before you start. And then several, it usually takes a month or two. And then you have this resolution of the spider veins after effective injections. The smaller spider veins can be treated with lasers on the skin. There's a certain wavelength that causes damage to the tissues inside these veins and causes them to clot off, and then they no longer transmit blood and they become scar tissue. And so that's, this is used on the very small veins and sometimes is an adjunct to the sclerotherapy. Phlebectomy means removal of veins. And so what we do for phlebectomy is the varicosities under the skin, usually the ones that are visible and palpable, can be removed through very small incisions. We call it a stab phlebectomy because we'll make a tiny one to two millimeter incision with a little, by poking with a knife. And then a hook is placed in around the vein and the vein is pulled up through the incision. And so the vein is, is disrupted and we try to get as much of the vein out as we can, but really it's, a, it's more importantly, you're, you're breaking the vein. And so your body can no longer use it to transmit blood, but it can't form clots in there and, and it ends up just becoming scar tissue under the skin. This will typically give a very nice cosmetic benefit if there are large varicosities present. It also stops these veins from ever getting clots in them themselves, which can be kind of an uncomfortable problem called uh, superficial thrombophobitis. Endovenous ablation has now become the standard of care for saphenous vein insufficiency. So when it's the saphenous vein, either the great saphenous or the small saphenous um, superficial veins that are, have broken valves, we can close them off. And so this involves placement of a special device inside the saphenous vein to close it off. And if you remember, this is the, the reason we're doing this, and it's only certain people that are candidates for this, is that this vein that we're trying to close has broken valves and is transmitting pressure down here. So the other vein, the deep veins, are okay. It's only this vein we're trying to treat so that the pressure is not transmitted down the leg. It's typically done in the office setting. So a catheter is inserted inside the vein and this device is, is advanced using ultrasound guidance up to the groin. Now that's the deep system here, so you don't want to go in there. We're only going to treat this problematic vein here. And so heat is applied. Uh, we put a, a numbing medicine around the vein with injections, so you don't feel it. But this is actually uh, 120 degrees Celsius. So this is a very hot catheter. It, it burns. And so we're closing off the vein using heat, and it no longer transmits any blood after this. And so we do it one segment at a time and pull back the catheter and do another segment. And uh, this procedure uh, takes about 30 to 45 minutes to perform. It's relatively painless and there's no, there's no real recovery period. And so our results are always very good. Sometimes we combine that treatment, which is the treatment of the source of the high blood pressure, with treatment using removal of the veins. And so sometimes we'll do a phlebectomy to remove the rest of the vein. So here's a new uh, device that's available. It's called the Vena Seal. It's from Medtronic Company. And this one involves placement of uh, glue inside the vein. So it's, it's, some of it is the same in that we're still going to access the inside of the vein and insert this catheter. As the catheter goes in the vein, this is their custom animation, but this is all inside the leg. The catheter is used to, to place a glue-like substance, which really is crazy glue, cyanoacrylate adhesive, which is just basically crazy glue for medical use. And so you compress the vein closed above, and then you place these dots of glue inside the vein, and little by little close it down. So you're sealing off the vein using glue. Now the, the beauty of this procedure is that all the numbing injections where I put the fluid around the vein don't have to happen. So this is, this is after the initial puncture of the vein and insertion of this catheter, you don't feel anything else except the pressure of pushing down on the leg. So it's a very comfortable procedure, and this may become the new way that this is done. It's still in its early phases of trials. And they just reported their three-year data from the, the initial uh, vein centers that are trying this out. So we, we don't know for sure that it's the same uh, long-term adequacy. However, it seems to be a pretty good treatment so far.
it's becoming less and less invasive all the time. Here's another picture of a, a patient that was treated with a combined procedure. This is the marked varicosities on the leg. They're marked preoperatively with a permanent marker and then uh, the vein that's causing the problems is closed and then phlebectomy performed and this is several weeks afterwards at the post-operative visit. And you can see there's just a few marks on the leg where these phlebectomies were performed. Those fade with time and after about three or four months they're completely gone in most patients. You have to stay out of the sun, that's the main thing. If you go there into the sun those will become permanent dark spots on your legs. So there are some other types of surgery for vein problems. When the deep vein valves are broken from blood clots or other problems, you can do surgery on them. But this is something that very few centers are doing because the results are not very good. There are some vein centers like Mayo Clinic in, in uh, Minnesota that are doing this and, and have relatively good results. And because it's such a difficult thing to do and requires a higher volume to, to have any success, they typically get all the referrals and so they're, they're a referral center for that. One of them uh, that you can do is to tighten the valves by suturing the valves on the walls to try and bring them together a little better. You can do an external treatment. If the diameter has gotten too large, you can bring it together, the, the valves using sutures and try to oppose the two pieces of the valve. People have tried polyester sleeves around the valve to try and make it work better. None of these work that well. Uh, valve transplantation can be performed where you take it from somewhere else in the body. The most common is to take it from the arm. Typically you don't get a post-thrombotic or problem in your arm. Or the varicose veins in the arm are very rare and usually related to obstruction. So the valve is not quite as essential there and it can be taken and transplanted down into the leg from the axillary vein to the femoral vein and create a valve that is functioning at that location. Other surgeries, like trying to direct the blood into the veins that have valves, can be done as well, but they're not commonly performed. And there are people working on implantable prosthetic valves. The idea is we want to have something that we can put through a tube into the vein and expand inside the vein, much like a stent that has valve function. And they're trying. We don't have any that are any good yet. So right now, they all form clots and they all have dysfunction. So we haven't really gotten there. I imagine the next 10 to 20 years we'll have some successful valves and that will change dramatically the way that we manage uh, valve disease or venous disease, especially with the deep system. And that's all I have for you. Thank you.